All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Nicole Wallace, and I'm the program director of the RYR1 Foundation. I would like to thank you all for watching this video. I'm joined today by Dr. Sheila Riazzi. Dr. Riazzi is an anesthesiologist in Toronto and a member of the Advisory Council of the Malignant Hyperthermia Association of the United States, otherwise known as MHAS. As you may be aware, individuals with mutations in the RYR1 gene may be at risk for malignant hyperthermia, which is a potentially fatal reaction to general anesthesia. The RYR1 Foundation spoke at the MHAS annual meeting last month. Prior to that meeting, we posted on various social media platforms, asking our followers to send us their questions related to MH. We were overwhelmed by the amount of questions we received, and it became apparent that while we tend to focus on the muscle weakness component of RYR1, the topic of MH is an issue of great importance to our community. This reason is why we feel very fortunate to have Dr. Riazzi, an internationally renowned expert in MH, join us today. Dr. Riazzi, thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Good morning. Good morning, of course. So basically, can we just start off um, by explaining to our viewers what exactly MH is? Um, so MH, or otherwise known as malignant hyperthermia, mm -hmm. it's a genetic disease uh, that um, basically patients who are susceptible to this disease uh, and have the genetic predisposition, mm -hmm. if given um, commonly used anesthetics, which are mainly volatile anesthetic, gas anesthetics, mm -hmm. as well as a specific muscle relaxant that we only use under anesthetic is called succinylcholine. Um, if they receive these, uh, they may show a reaction, uh, which uh, can include the rigidity, so mm -hmm. body stiffness, and the temperature can go up, uh, hyperthermia, that's called, mm -hmm. and their heart rate goes up, and the, um, in basically, in summary, we call it a hypermetabolic event, meaning that our metabolism goes up. And uh, historically, uh, it's been shown that if this, if the reaction occurs and it's not picked up uh, fast enough or is not, uh, you know, patient doesn't get the treatment, um, the mortality rate can go up to 80%. Wow. Wow. Well, thank you, Dr. Yazzi. So that brings us to our next question. What is the relationship between an RYR1 mutation and malignant hyperthermia? So do all mutations carry a risk for MH? Um, very good question. So, as I said, MH is a genetic disease, and so far we know of three genes. Mm -hmm. uh, RYR1 is one of them, uh, that uh, the variants or changes in these genes can potentially make the patients or the individual carrying that change uh, be susceptible to malignant hyperthermia. Okay. Now, to answer your question, the second question, that all, if all the RYR1 uh, variant carrier, they have um, susceptibility to MH. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very difficult question, actually, it's a million dollar question. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> um, so, uh, in order to get into the answer, um, let me just give a bit of an introductory Please. thing. Um, so, RYR1 is uh, basically a gene that encodes a huge protein in mm -hmm. the skeletal muscle um, uh, cells called RYR1 or radium receptor type 1. So the changes in the gene can be classified basically very simplistic approaches to three classification. Some of the changes, we call them benign, meaning that the changes in the gene is not that bad mm -hmm. or may not actually affect the function of the protein. So those we call them polymorphism okay. and they're not disease causing of any sort. Mm -hmm. Then we have the other extreme that the changes are so bad that can cause dysfunction of the protein, and those are the mutation. Now, we have some changes in the RYR1 or many other genes that we call them uh, unknown significance, or we call them variants of unknown significance, mm -hmm. meaning that we still don't know how it, it can interpret into the uh, uh, basically functionality of the protein. Mm -hmm. Can it affect it? Can it affect it in a bad way or what? So for the mutation one, uh, there are, based on European image guidelines, there are um, 
proven at least 35 mutations in RYR1 wow. um, that are proven to be disease, image causing. Okay. For the VUS ones, for the variant of unknown significance, it's unknown mm -hmm. significance. So some of them, yes, if uh, there has been some functional analysis done or there have been any other further investigation done, right. we can kind of say that it can cause image, but some of them no. So okay. again, to, uh, to answer your question, not all the RYR1 variants can cause image. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. So this leads into our third question as well. So for a family who has just found out they have a mutation, how do they determine whether or not to take MH precautions? So in other words, if an individual had their genetic results in front of them, what should they look for or what would you tell them to think about in regards to their specific mutation? It's, it's very complex mm -hmm. uh, to basically, um, it's not like you're looking at your hemoglobin level yeah. and you see a range and you can say, well, this is abnormal, mm -hmm. or this is, I have my hemoglobin is low or high or normal. When you see the genetic results, I strongly recommend whoever, you know, the patients or, you know, our parents that they see the genetic results, they should definitely um, go to a genetic counselor. Okay. To gen geneticians and get their um, uh, basically feedback and their get the get the counseling because they that? are the one that can help them and say yes this is a disease causing mm -hmm. or this is the one we don't know or maybe you should be referred to an MH center for further you know investigations and counseling right wonderful so with that, would you be able to provide some insight on if there is uniform agreement or some difference depending on who you ask in regards to MH? So, people who know about MH and well, or more knowledgeable about yes. MH are neuromuscular neurologists, okay, um, as well as anesthesiologists. Mm -hmm. Not not all the anesthesiologists, but they know the MH very well. But in terms of the genetic variants. Mm -hmm. Um, the anesthesiologists who are specialized uh, or they have done some work in MH or work in an MH center or there's a hot, uh, hotline basically uh, for uh, from MH US mm -hmm. um, and it's a group of anesthesiologists who are specialized in MH. So these people are the ones that can give further information. Wonderful. And um, I think the family doctors, they uh, would be a great resource to probably find the closest possible center or closest possible neurologist who is specialized in this and Great. refer the patients. Great, thank you. So then can we explain to our followers what Awake MH is? I know that we receive a lot of questions regarding this and it's of much yeah. concern to individuals. So it's a bit of a controversy with mm -hmm. the term Awake MH. Um, I would rather use as, as an MH-like reaction. Okay. In patient because I don't know if you call it that you know there's differences in terminology or I like to use MH reaction as an anesthetic induced okay so uh, anesthetic induced obviously this it happens to when the patient is asleep yes. so and answering to questions some of our MH susceptible patients known MH susceptible patients or unknown MH mm -hmm. susceptible patients they um, may show some hypermetabolism, as we discussed before. So um, high meta metabolic, uh, basically, rates and everything mm -hmm. with certain activities, especially exertion in a very uh, hot, basically, environment. So mm -hmm. high ambient temperature, they exert, and they may show that muscle breakdown and high temperature. Right increased carbon dioxide production. So it the reaction looks like uh, MH, mm -hmm. but as I said, I like to say MH-like reaction. Okay. Um, because the triggers are not the anesthetic. Mm -hmm. The triggers could be other things, so exertion and heat. And lately, we also not noticed that some patients may get, um, say, viral illness, like yes. a common cold, and they exert or they have a bit of activity in the context of the common cold, and then they have... Uh, the MH-like reaction. Wonderful, thank you. So then, w what is the treatment for MH? Is there something that individuals can be doing to prevent this? So, uh, treatment and prevention.
intervention. So treatment, if it happens during the, say, operation, during the anesthetic, mm -hmm. we have a known, treat, uh, basically a drug, it's called gantrolene, and that can be used, and it's actually a very uh, good drug because it can reverse the process very fast. Mm -hmm. um, now, in terms of uh, prevention, so for the anesthetic-induced MH prevention, um, it's basically avoiding triggers, avoiding right. again, anesthetic and succinylcholine. For a rate or MH-like mm -hmm. reaction in yes. a MH susceptible patient, <laughs> um, it's a bit difficult. Okay. Because it's very difficult to restrict someone and say, you can't run, you can't do this. Or, but right. So body awareness, I always tell my patients that you have to be aware of what's happening to your body. If you think it's too hot outside, don't go run. Mm -hmm. If that's not probably good. Or don't play beach volleyball. If you're image susceptible, that's probably not a good idea. The worst thing, yeah. Exactly. Because it's a hot, you know, temperature and you exert quite a bit. Exactly. So, uh, basically, prevention, in my opinion, is the treatment now. Perfect. I love that. Thank you. So, if an individual has a mutation and they were exposed to anesthesia but did not have a reaction, does that mean they are in the clear for all of their future procedures? No, unfortunately, I wish it were that simple. Mm -hmm. So, um, for certain genetic diseases, we have a term called variable penetrance, mm -hmm. meaning that you may have the susceptibility based on you have the uh, variant or mutation in that gene, but you won't show it mm -hmm. all the time. So, you may have had one or two or three triggered anesthetic, and everything was fine, and then you show it on your fourth or fifth anesthetic. Mm -hmm. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, the highest number reported um, is probably nine anesthetic. Wow. And wow. yeah, and on the tenth one. Often. So having a couple of uneventful anesthetic, yep. unfortunately, cannot really rule out the disease. Okay. Well, thank you for clarifying that. That's definitely something of much importance to our families and individuals to of know course. that. And yeah, definitely. Um, so is there a test for MH or is genetic testing sufficient to know? Um, so basically there are two diagnostic tests for MH. Genetic testing is one, which is, well, the easier mm -hmm. of the two because it's only a blood test. But um, we, as I said before, we only know three genes that are causing the disease. And these three genes combined are probably, optimistically talking, are responsible for 55 or 60 percent. Wow. So if your genetic testing is negative, it doesn't mean you don't have MH mm -hmm. or you, you're not MH susceptible. Yeah. So the ultimate testing is the muscle biopsy uh, and basically called caffeine halotin contracture testing. Okay. Um, which uh, it's a certain type of biopsy. So it's not like a punch biopsy. It requires a bit more muscle. Mm -hmm. And it has to be done in specialized testing center because the muscle has to be removed in a way that it doesn't uh, affect the viability of the muscle. So it's a physiological testing mm -hmm. on the muscle. Okay. And the sensitivity uh, reported being uh, either the, uh, done in uh, you know, North America or Europe, sensitivity is about 97 to 100 percent. Wow. And that's the ultimate testing for MH okay. uh, as opposed to genetics. So going off of pretty much everything that we just talked about with testing, genetic testing, uh, muscle biopsy, we receive this question all the time. Do I have MH? So what would you tell our audience? Um, how would you respond to them to this question? So first of all, MH is a rare disease. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't think it varies to screen every single individual. Mm -hmm. But if there is a family history of um, anesthetic reaction, mm -hmm. or if there is a family history of, um, uh, say, uh, myopathy of unknown you know, origin, or specifically talking RYR1 mm -hmm. myopathies, uh, or uh, call the other gene, is CACNA1S or dihydropyridine receptor um, related myopathies, those individuals should be um, screened and tested and okay. basically assessed yes. for possibility of uh, being MH susceptible. Okay, thank you. And then lastly, um, if you have a child who is affected and both parents are unaffected but are carriers, should the parents also take MH precautions or are they okay? So, yes, it has to be 
things. First of all, again, I strongly recommend that these individuals should mm -hmm. be assessed by genetic counselors because it depends. If you have a child that has a compound, is a compound heterozygous, mm -hmm. therefore RYR1, and parents have one variant, like say father has one variant and mother has another mm -hmm. variant. Um, and those variants have to be assessed, and if uh, they're a known mutation, yes, parents could be actually MH susceptible, okay. but not overtly showing any myopathies, and yes. the child who got these two genes all together, mm -hmm. not only is MH susceptible, but also showing myopathy. Okay. But also there are, say, um, individuals that say the mom has a deletion, or stop codon variant. Mm -hmm. The deletion doesn't predispose to MH susceptibility because you always need two copies of the gene. Mm -hmm. And if there's a deletion and you don't have one copy, the other copy is still a good one. So it produces good protein and mm -hmm. you're good. Yes. So in those cases, say the mom has a deletion copy, a deletion variant, and the dad has another variant, and the child who got the deletion from mom, so it doesn't have that protein, and the other protein is already a bad one, mm -hmm. and myopathy, then in those cases, only I say dad and the child are MH susceptible. So okay. based on all these complexities, I think each uh, pedi or each family member should be um, assessed again by genetic counselors. Well, wonderful. It's hard to generalize that. Yeah, exactly. So uh, Dr. Yazi, I just want to thank you so much for your time, your insight on all of our questions, and on behalf of the RY1 community and the RY1 Foundation, we greatly value your expertise um, on MH and just thank you for shedding some light on the, the countless questions we have received multiple times. And I know that our families, our followers, um, individuals will be so thankful for you. And I want to thank you. Oh, thank you very much for arranging this, Nicole. And I'm, I, I really respect what you guys are doing at RYR1 Foundation and uh, it's a it's a very nice patient advocacy you know organization and I'm really honored uh, to be part of this and be able to answer at least some of the questions. And you did Dr. Riazi. Thank you so much once again and have a great day. You too. All right, Bye. talk to you later. Bye. <laughs>